So in verses in verse verses one of two of Second Kings chapter twenty five, it tells us now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came up against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall all around it. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Now, up to this point, guys, we've been witnessing with our own eyes the truth of God's word and the severity of his judgment specifically against the kingdom of Judah for their consistent turning to idolatry. When we look at 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 26 and 27, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocations which, with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. In 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 3, it tells us, Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah, to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and because of the innocent blood, which he had shed for the uh, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood with which the Lord would not pardon. The Lord has been keeping his promise up to this point to bring his righteous judgment against a nation called to be his own people. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 chapter 7 verse 6 regarding being called his holy people he says this for you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. To the Lord God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So what has happened? We see that God is obviously upset. It tells us here in the verses that we looked at that he was provoked to anger. Manasseh, who was a king previously, and his son Ammon, were kings that reintroduced idolatry in the kingdom of Judah. Now remember with me, Judah is special. Because if you know that Israel's consisted of 12 tribes, one of them being the tribe of Judah. And we know that all the way since 1 Kings, that the, king, the, the tribe of Judah was always in power and in the king of Israel. But when these tribes were broken up and, and Israel itself was broken in half where we had the tribe of, we have the nation of Israel and the southern part of Israel called Judah. This is where it becomes a little crazy. What is so special about Judah? Well, it was the line of Judah where David came out of, where Solomon came out of, and eventually our Messiah, Jesus, has come out of. So this tribe of Judah, of one of the 12 tribes that make up all of Israel, has always been very special in the eyes of the Lord. We saw that David, King David, was a man that was a man after God's own heart. Solomon, who was considered the wisest man of the entire history of the world. But you even see with Solomon that with all the women that he married. He had something like 763 wives, 300 concubine. I mean, imagine the time of the month it would be horrible. I mean, I can barely handle my wife's time of the month. Imagine over a thousand women. And it was because of these women, they began to bring their own gods into the kingdom of Judah. And ever since then, there has been this propensity to follow these worthless idols. And when Judah and, and Israel split, and Rehoboam was the king of Judah, he began to allow other gods to be worshipped as his father Solomon. 
He never removed them from the city of Jerusalem, nor of the tribe of Judah. And this began to gain traction and momentum. And by the time we see Josiah as the one of the greatest kings of Judah, once he dies, his son Manasseh comes on the throne and begins to introduce or reestablish idolatry in such a grotesque way. Well, what is idolatry? It's a worship of idols. It is when we take something and we begin to worship that instead of God. And today, idol worshiping comes in many forms. It doesn't have to be a statue. It doesn't have to be an image. It can be a lot of different things today. It can be lust. It can be women. It can be pride. It can be greed. It can be a lot of number, a, a lot of different things. And oftentimes, as Christians, what can happen is that we can begin to allow these idols creep into our lives, and and it, what it begins to do, it begins to remove the true worship of God. And here. God had warned Josiah through a prophet, for a prophet is saying, I am going to bring judgment to the kingdom of Judah. Matter of fact, I'm going to wipe them clean as a plate. I am going to remove them out of my sight. Now, we talked a little bit about this last week. Being removed from God's sight. I mean, I don't know if we understand the true impact and the magnitude of what that truly means. Because a lot of us Christians here have always can, can oftentimes take for granted being in the sight of the Lord, being in the presence of the Lord. Because our hearts and our, the Bible tells us that our hearts are always open before the Lord. He knows what we think. He knows what we're, we're doing. He knows what we do in secret. He knows what we do in the dark. He knows what we do when no one else is around. He knows the intentions and the motives of our hearts. And we've never, ever been casted away from God's presence. We may say this, oh, I walked away from the Lord. We can say that. You know, when I was backslidden or when I fell away from the Lord, I walked away from him. Yeah, we may have walked away from him. But according to Psalm 139, it tells us how can we ever escape his presence? We may have turned away from the Lord, but God's presence has never left us as Christians. So we don't understand what it means to be removed from the sight of God. But and as I mentioned this last week, there will be a day when each and every one of us will stand before the Lord. Hebrews is very clear about that all of us have a death date. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 that all of us are appointed unto death, all of us, and after this judgment. So as I've been sharing before, all of us have this hourglass that when we were born has been turned upside down and the sand is running out every single moment of our day. That sand is getting less and less and less and less. And when that sand runs out, runs out that is the day that we will stand before the Lord. And as we stand before the Lord for the believer, we will hear these words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But for those who do not know the Lord, for those who even played Christian, he will say, depart from me out of my presence, for I never knew you. Talking about being removed from the side of the Lord, here now Judah, his own people, are now experiencing the removal of being in God's presence. We have seen that every king since King Josiah, and there has been four of them, every one of those kings after King Josiah has done evil in the sight of the Lord. Every one of them. And this is how idolatry affects the heart. Because when our hearts are lifted up with other things other than the Lord, our hearts become rebellious and it becomes self-gratifying. Think about it for a moment. The very heart of what idolatry is, the very heart of idolatry, the worshiping of other things, is to worship and serve the very thing that brings pleasure to our lives. Think about it for a moment. 
If I were to ask you this morning, what is, and I know some of you who are walking on water this morning are very super spiritual, so you're going to say Jesus. I know that. But if we're real to our, with ourselves, what is the thing that you're thinking about the most this morning other than me because I'm in your presence? What is it that you're thinking about? What is it that's consuming your thoughts? What is the very thing this morning that you've been thinking about the whole time before you got here? You're going to think about it as soon as we're done and you spend your time thinking about it. That's what you're worshiping. And what you worship is what you will serve. And, what, and the reason why we fixate on these things is because it brings self-gratifying pleasures to the flesh. I've never any, ever heard anybody say, well, I watch pornography for my health. We watch pornography because it gratifies our flesh. We pursue material things because it gives us a sense of accomplishment in a gratifying way. Any idol that we worship is the very thing that brings pleasure to our lives. Think about it. Money, pride, position, relationships. These are the things that we can fixate and worship on. And when we do that, we will begin to serve that. And this is where it gets dangerous. Because every idol we have lifted up in our lives brings nothing but pleasure to the flesh. And what I mean flesh, I don't mean skin. I mean the carnal person that lives within us. For me, it was drug addiction. I didn't get high because my relationship with my parents were jacked up. I didn't get high because I was abused as a kid. I didn't get high because I didn't have my parents or I didn't have a mom or I didn't have a fish or a cat or a dog. I didn't get high for any of those reasons. I got high because I love to get high. Amen. And people will mask their idolatry with, well, I was raised this way. We have a tendency to excuse those things that bring gratification to our flesh. I was addicted to pornography. Not because Jupiter didn't line up with Venus or that I was kicked out of the third grade. Had nothing to do with that. I was addicted to pornography because it brought pleasure to me. And idol worshiping is truly about gratifying our flesh. Idol worshiping does not command us to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. It commands us to do what feels good. It's your life. You deserve it. Idol worshiping doesn't command us to love one another as Christ has loved the church. It commands us to love yourself and do what you want before you love anybody else. Idol worship is selfish. Self selfish. Living for Jesus is selfless. Idol worshiping is living for the flesh. Living for Jesus is living in the spirit. How are you living, men? What are those things that have consumed your minds in such a way that has drowned out the worship of God? It's easy to do. It can be a lot of different things that can creep into our lives. You know, for a while, for me, you know, you think, well, I'm going to church on Wednesdays and Tuesday mornings and Sundays. You know, so, I, and, and there's nothing wrong with doing hobbies. I think the only thing that cannot ever be an idol, and I've, I'm trying to find it in scripture, is playing golf. <laughs> if you play golf, you're good. There's never, there's no idolatry there. I should know, I've done, we are doing it every Friday. And that's the only thing I thought about. So, yeah, that, no. We have to be careful whatever it is because it's about gratifying our flesh. Idol worship is selfish. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, it tells us about the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are evident, which, is, which are adultery, not idolatry, adultery. We know what adultery is, right? It's when you're married and you have a relationship with somebody else, a sexual relationship or emotional or physical or spiritual relationship. Fornication. 
We know what fornication is, right? Having sex outside of marriage. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, jealousy, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I have also told you in time past, that these, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Idolatry. Galatians 5.16 says, I, then, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this is what brought judgment to Judah because these kings were bringing in idolatry and saying, you know, Judah, children of God, don't serve the Lord. You don't have to, oh, you know what? You can serve him too, but you know, we're going to bring in Asterisk, the sex goddess. And we're going to put her statue that's very revealing right in the middle of the temple. So when you come in to worship God, we're going to draw your attention from worshiping God. And we're going to have you look right at this statue. And we're going to have orgies with the temple prostitutes in any of these rooms that you want. You know what is so disgusting about that? Is that God has called us men to be temple of the Holy Spirit. And yet we can erect these statues in our hearts that were made to worship the Lord. And we can have these orgies with these temple prostitutes in our hearts when the hearts are designed to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. If we were to take a illustration and use our sanctuary, and instead of where it says where we would we that we could that we would see Jesus. We put, a, we put a statue of a very provocative and revealing naked woman on the wall. And in the back of the stage, you're going to say, hey, you know what? If you want to, if this arouses you, we have three rooms in the back there. And each of those rooms, we're going to show pornography. And any of you guys that come in and are, are provoked by the statue where instead of saying we would see Jesus, it's this statue of this very provocative, naked woman. And at your pleasure, if you want to go in the back and watch pornography in any of these rooms, we have that set up for you. How would you guys respond to that? I mean, what's your thoughts about that? It's, it's disgusting, right? This is what they were doing in the temple of God. Imagine. But yet we do the same thing, men. When we've allowed worship of something else to take the place of worship of God in our lives. You know what we're doing? We're prostituting. So what's the difference? We're reading here like, oh, that's disgusting. But what's the difference now? How many of us, we want to talk about worship and be real. How many of us are looking at the words on the screen during worship and just repeating them, but our minds and our thoughts and our hearts are elsewhere? Right? Right? I mean, if we're just real with ourselves. Since the last good king of Judah, King Josiah, there have been four kings that all have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Josiah's fourth son, Joaz, reigned three months. His name was Shalom. Josiah's second son, Jehoiakim, reigned 11 years. His name was really Eliakim. Jehoiachin, which is Josiah's grandson of his second son, reigned three months. And Zedekiah, of who we're going to look at today, reigned 11 years, who was the uncle to Jehoiachin. So now we begin our study after that long introduction. And we're going to look at the very last king, Zedekiah. Now when... When you look in chapter 24, just a couple of verses up from where we're at right now, I want us to point something out about Zedekiah. It tells us in verse 19 of chapter 24 that he also did evil in the sight of the Lord according that all Jehoiachin had done, which would have been his uncle. And it says, For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, 
that he finally cast him out from his presence, then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So right off the bat, in the, in the last verse of the previous chapter, we're told of something of Zedekiah, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, just like his uncle, and he rebelled against the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Now what's interesting about this last king of Judah is again that he rebels against Babylon. By this time, remember Egypt? There's Pharaoh Necho or Necho. Necho. He is, remember in, in, in verse 7 of, the last, of chapter 24 that Babylon came and, and destroyed Egypt in the battle of Carchemish? And at this battle, Egypt was pretty much stripped of their military power. And it tells us in verse 7 that Egypt no longer came out of their land. This was done by Babylon. Now, with this new king, Zedekiah, let me back up. And so what usually happens here is when a king is conquered, he becomes subject to a more powerful king. This is called a vassal. And this and the, the king that has been overtaken now will be ran by this more powerful king where the weaker king will now pay tribute and taxes to this king. And this king will come and use their daughters and the women and the wives. They'll take them from themselves and they'll take all the treasures out of a temple that is there. And they become subject to this more powerful king. But we see here that Zedekiah now rebels as a vassal, he rebels against Babylon. Because by this time, there's a different king in Egypt. His name is Hophra. He is the grandson of Pharaoh Necho, or Necho. And he influenced Zedekiah to rebel against Babylon. When you look at Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 15, it talks about this rebellion. It says, but he rebelled against him by sending ambassadors to Egypt that they may give him horses and many people. Will he prosper? Will he who does such a thing escape? Can he break a covenant and still be delivered? So we see here that this king, Zedekiah now, rebels against the king of Babylon. Big mistake. Big mistake. For some reason he thought that he can go to Egypt and get horses and get men. Even Ezekiel saying, will he prosper? What a dumb move. Will he, he who does this thing, will he escape the great hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon? No. Because of this, look what happens in verse 1 of chapter 25. Now it came to pass. I mean, it's going to happen. In the ninth year of his reign, this is Zedekiah, in the tenth month, on the 10th day, very specific of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and how many of his army? All of his, All of his army. Came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall around it. Now, responding to, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to Zedekiah's rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar sent his entire army to encamp. Now, they're, remember, they're already encamped. But those were just his servants. Remember that? You see that Nebuchadnezzar sent his servants. Now he's sending his entire army to go and, lay, and, and encamp around the city of Jerusalem to lay siege around it. Remember the word siege is not a word that we usually kick around these days, but the word siege is to surround it in such a way that nothing or nobody or no imports or no exports can leave the city. Usually what that does, it starves the people out because there's nothing coming in or, nor coming out. And it tells us here in verse 1 that the siege began in the ninth year of his reign, of, of Zedekiah's reign. We are told here also that a siege wall is built. Now a siege wall, usually because if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll see that Jerusalem is is uh, is gated. It has these huge gates around it. They're walls. And it would be to protect the city of Jerusalem. And these walls are massive. 
They, they're, they, they're made out of stone. They're huge. A siege wall would be built to go higher than these walls. So it would be able for easy for them to jump in, to break through and begin to break the walls down. And then what they would also do is they would make a barricade out of dirt. So once you're in that siege wall, then there's another barricade you had to go through. Usually these were wood because it was easy for them to reestablish them if they had to go to another part of the wall. And what they would do is they would build this wooden siege wall that would be above the walls of Jerusalem and they would begin to break it down. The reason why they would break it down is what that it would keep Jerusalem from being able to reinforce those walls in a short time. So instead of jumping over the walls and, and, and getting in there, they begin to break the walls down. When we look at verse 2, it now gives us a timeline of how long this besieging took place. It says, so the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Two and a half years. The ninth year of his reign was in 580 BC. It was besieged until the 11th year. Jerusalem withstood the siege until the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign. Remember, it tells us in verse 1 that it was the ninth year that he reigned. So this besieging took place. It says it was the ninth year that Nebuchadnezzar came and surrounded the city. Here in verse 2, it tells us that the city was besieged until the ninth year, the 11th year. So for two and a half years, nothing could come in or come out. Nothing was able to be imported or exported. Nothing was able, nobody was able to leave the city or come into the city. And we see here that it now be, it caused a great famine. But what's interesting, what, how, let me ask you guys a question, you Bible buffs. Why was Jerusalem able to withstand two and a half years of being under siege? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because when you look at what, because one of the reasons that they were able to withstand this dates back to King Hezekiah. What did Hezekiah do? For all of you guys who've been to Jerusalem, he brought in the underground tunnel with the water. Remember that? Hezekiah's tunnel. He made a tunnel that came from the upper part of the city that would run underneath the walls of the city that no enemy was able to detect it. So he was able, so the city was able to continue to harvest, continue to, to have uh, water. Because in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? If you ever go to Israel, you'll be able to go in that tunnel. It's underground, and the water is knee deep, maybe waist deep. And uh, you, it's, it's, it's quite of a walk. But as usual, when there is a prolonged sieging, the most severe deprivation occurs. And here, all of Jerusalem was now faced with starvation. As the months passed, there was less and less to eat. And what we see here in verse 3, by the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. I will remove you from my presence, the Lord says. They're now dying of starvation. Why? Because of idol worshiping. When the city is under siege, nothing can come in and come out. This means that the food supplies are severely affected. Food runs out, which ultimately leads to famine. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of this famine. Interesting. In Lamentations chapter 1, verse 11, it says, All the people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Jeremiah wrote these words in the early days of the siege. It was still possible that there was an open market for people to trade, but soon Jeremiah would then say in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 12, they cried to their mothers, speaking of children, where is bread and wine? 
and they faint like the wounded men in the streets of the city as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom, crying babies dying in their mother's bosom. Is idolatry worth it? Here's more severity of this famine. In Lamentations chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, happier, happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of fruit of the field. Their hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became food during their destruction of the daughter of my people, Judah. Ultimately, Jeremiah speaks again of this famine, famine in Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 2 through 3. It says, Thus says the Lord, Who remains in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, shall live. His life shall be a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. That was from Jeremiah. Eventually, Jerusalem was so weakened to the point that King Nebuchadnezzar can now break through the walls. A tactic from the enemy. He's always looking at the walls surrounding your heart. And eventually, he will try to weaken you by distracting you. Don't read your word. You don't need to read your Bible. Don't go to church. You don't need the fellowship. You don't need to hear the word of God. And he be, he, instead, do the things you like to do. Go and fulfill the pleasures of your life. And what happens is that the walls that surround our hearts become weakened. And the enemy will begin to break through the walls up into your heart. What's in our hearts? A lot of things. Who we are. What are the things that you hold dear to your heart? My children, sometimes. <laughs> My wife, most of the time. No, I'm just even. <laughs> but what are the things that we hold dear to our hearts? That's what the enemy is after. And he will take you to a place where you're weakened. You're famished and deprived from God's word. The walls around your heart are weakened. You're deprived from praying. The walls around your heart are weakened. You don't go to church. The walls around your heart are weakened. I filled my walls with the self-gratification, self-pleasures. The walls are your heart of your heart are being weakened. And eventually the enemy will break through. And he will rip everything off from your heart. That's happened to me many times, you guys. I thought I could fill my life with this and fill my life with that, fill my life with this. And the enemy comes in and rips off my dignity, my joy, what little, not in a proudful way, but little pride of being even just a man. Love, joy, forgiveness, mercy, grace, all ripped off. And what's interesting here is that when this happened, the, the, the mighty men of Jerusalem, all the military might of Jerusalem, made one last attempt, and look what it says in verse 4, then the city wall was broken through, and how many of the men? All the men of war. These are bad dudes. These are your special forces. These are your mercenaries. These are all the men of war that were selected they fled. They fled by night. They fled uh, by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, which is in the furthest west in Jerusalem. And it says here, which was by the king's garden, even the Chaldeans or the Babylonians were still encamped all around against the city. And the king, by, and the king went by the way of the plain. The king split. All the mighty warriors left. How do you think the people felt? They're starving. They're eating their own children. Babies are dying in the bosom of holding them in the lap of their mama. And the, all the mighty men leave. 
And then the king leaves. Isn't it the captain, the last one to go down on a ship? Mm -hmm. You see the heart of this king here. That's the heart of idolatry. Just look out for me. He abandons the people. The invaders broke through the wall and took the city. They looted and destroyed the houses and finally burning the city and the temple in August 14, 586 BC. The prophet Jeremiah had counseled Zedekiah and his officers to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and save the city and the temple. When you look in Jeremiah chapter 21 or you look in Jeremiah uh, chapter 38 verses 1 through 6, you will see that, uh, that Zedekiah refused to obey the God's word and he had Jeremiah arrested as a traitor. Look, God's plan was to have Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed. But he also told Zedekiah that if you surrender into the hands of Babylonians, I will continue to keep the temple. I will continue to keep my people. I will continue to be a nation for Jerusalem. I just, I'll need you. I am going to allow this to happen, but Zedekiah refuses. So the officer, so Jeremiah is telling him, just surrender. This is all part of God's plan, according to God's word. And he, and he throws Jeremiah in prison and calls him a traitor. The officers put him in court, under court guard and, and dropped Jeremiah into an abandoned cistern where, where he would have died, but he had been rescued. When you look in Jeremiah chapter 38, you, you can read about this. But this hypocritical and weak king, Zedekiah, told Jeremiah, ask the Lord what he shall do. But Zedekiah refused to accept the prophet's answer. Then Zedekiah asked Jeremiah to pray for him in Jeremiah chapter 37. But the king was a proud man who refused to humble himself and pray himself. So when the city walls were broken through, all the men of war fled, and Zedekiah went out by plane, by a plane. Now, it wasn't a plane, Learjet. It was by the plains of Jericho. They didn't have planes back then, you guys. Just seeing if you're still awake. <laughs> Jeremiah again speaks of this in Jeremiah 39, 2. In the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month of the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 12. And the prince who is among them shall hear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the walls to carry him through it. He shall cover his face that they cannot see the ground with his eyes. They're talking about Zedekiah's escape. He leaves. And when you look at Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 1 through 7, I didn't put it on here, but if you read it yourself, you will read about Jeremiah's prophecy regarding this. With the city now surrounded by the Babylonians, everybody was doomed to fail. And in verse 5, it says, But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, they overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all of his army was scattered from him. Do you guys notice here the words used? The Chaldeans or the Babylonians or the enemy. The enemy pursued. The enemy overtook. And the enemy scattered. It's a picture of how the enemy fights against us. He's pursuing you guys. Because he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your marriage. And if we're not in God's word, he will overtake us. He will. This is why it's so important, men, that every single day we put on the armor of God. Every single day that we're in God's word. Every single day that we're in prayer. Because he's in pursuit of you. And his desire is to steal from you, to destroy, kill you, and destroy you your families, your marriages, you. And if we're not in prayer or in God's word, it will be a matter of time until he will overtake you and destroy you. He will then scatter what's left of you everywhere. Remember, guys, the same thing happened to me. Caught up in drug addiction. Stop reading my word. Stop coming to church. Stop doing the things I needed to do. And it was a matter of time and the enemy did overtake me. You know how I was scattered? I lost my relationship with my parents, 
with my sister. All significant relationships in my life were severed. Any dignity that I had, gone. Anything I had materially, gone. Men, if we think we can get through this life without God's word, without being in prayer, without coming to church, it's just a matter of time till the enemy will pursue you and overtake you. And it tells us here that they, they catch him in the plains of Jericho. And in verse 7, oh, so in verse 6, so they took up the king and they brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah and they pronounced judgment on him. Look at verse 7, the result of idolatry. Is it worth it? Then they killed his sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Before his eyes. Put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar in verse 6, Zedekiah faced Nebuchadnezzar at his headquarters in Riblah, where he was found guilty of rebellion, and he's now sentenced to exile in Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 9, so they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath and pronounced judgment on him. But first, to give the king one lasting tormenting memory, the Babylonians killed all of his sons right before his eyes. Then they gouged his eyes out. Now I was reading that gouging. It wasn't they just poked his eyes out. A couple of commentators say they used like a spoon knife type of deal where they would go in there and they would go around it and pop it out. So we have two eyes. Just take one eye done, you still got one more. Ezekiel in Babylon prophesied that this would happen. And it's when you look at Ezekiel chapter 12, 1 through 13, read it. It gives it in detail. But imagine, the last thing that Zedekiah will always remember seeing are his sons being killed. That's the last thing he'll ever see. And then they gouge his eyes out. They, I was reading, they say they, one commentary says what they would do is because the eye has so many nerve endings and it has such an intricate set up that again they would go around the eye socket for all you clam eaters there they would they would shut the clam and they would first go lightly and then they would go deeper and then they would just pop the eye out and they did that to both of his eyes but first imagine the last thing you see are your children being killed his eyes were put out so that the death of their son, sons will be the last visual image he ever receives. Zedekiah's suffering, his suffering, why did he suffer? This is on him. He chose idolatry. He chose to reject God's word. He chose to put away the prophet Jeremiah. And the same could be said for those who have allowed idolatry to sneak into our lives. It's just a matter of time until we are pursued, overtook, and scattered. Men, what do you choose today? Do you choose to serve idols that will ultimately destroy your life? You may think that you're living the vida loca right now, serving these idols. You may think that you're getting away with it. You may think that it's bringing such great pleasure to you. But just remember, just like Zedekiah, he was pursued, overtaken, and scattered. Are you serving idols? Or men, is it for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Which is it, men? Today is the decision for you decide which you will serve. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, to see this a besieging of Babylon to Judah, your people. And I can only imagine, Lord, how difficult as these people are considered your people that 
this judgment came on him. But it tells us that you are a righteous and true God. And Lord, we see a picture of idol worshiping in Zedekiah and what it leads to. Lord, today I ask that you would fill these men with your Holy Spirit. And if there, if there is a, if their hearts have been filled with idolatry, Lord, I pray that you would, that you would speak to them, Lord, that they would remove these things, Lord, and, and replace it with true worship for you. So Lord Jesus, I ask that some this morning may say, Lord, I need you come into my heart. So Lord, I ask that you would honor that and that you would fill them with your presence. And Lord, as we now break bread, that you would bless the food. Thank you for the brothers that are watching online. Those later on who will watch this, Lord, may you be glorified and honored. And Lord, for us men, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for watching online. Oh, I had to represent. I'm waiting for any other uh, local guys. Thank you guys for watching online. Oh, my bad. You got <laughs> Andy, I even had it written in my Bible right here. All right, you guys, just a reminder. Man, I, oh, I put it right here. Look, Andy. Andy tickets. And I didn't even see it. A reminder. Listen up, you guys, really quick. Really quick, you guys, listen up. So our Super Bowl tickets are on sale. Joey's back there. He'll buy them for anybody who needs them. Uh, he's back there now. Uh, you guys get them because in a couple of weeks we will be, actually it's in a couple of weeks, uh, purchase them. We're going to have a great breakfast. And he's in the back selling those tickets now. God bless you guys. Thank you.